This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good evening, my name is Nigella Hilgarth and I'm the Executive Director of the Birch Aquarium and welcome to the latest perspective on ocean science lecture, that is the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science. And it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Doug Bartlett. Doug received his PhD in prokaryotic molecular biology from the University of Illinois and he was a research scientist at the Agaron Institute and then he saw the error of his ways and he assumed a faculty position at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC um, San Diego. And he now uh, holds the rank of professor. Professor Bartlett has extensive experience in the molecular and physiological analysis of microbial life in extreme environments. And he and his research group have pioneered genetic studies of microbes that live in great depth and this group was the first to identify some of the genes that um, are actually regulated by, by pressure and also the genes that are required for organisms to survive uh, under high pressure. And current research projects include the ecology of deep French microbial life, Hadal metagenomics, and single cell genomics, and the isolation and characterization of novel high pressure adapted microbial life forms. And I suspect he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of that work tonight. And I, for one, can't wait to hear about exploring the abyss, the deep uh, sea challenge expedition that he was recently on. So please uh, join me in welcoming Doug this evening. Thank you, Nigella. That was very kind. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. I see a few familiar faces and uh, a, a lot of new faces. I hope you haven't heard me uh, discuss the, the Deep Sea Challenge. Ex oh, stay in the light. Oh, I'm sorry, stay in the light. Oh, that's going to be difficult for me. <laughs> I'm too antsy. <laughs> um, I've given a number of presentations about the Deep Sea Challenge, and so I, I hope I'm not repeating myself to, to any of you. This was an absolutely incredible experience. I think. One of the great things we have going in oceanography, and that Scripps in particular, is we have an opportunity to hobnob with scientists from all sorts of different stripes to go out to sea and interact across disciplines. And it's all very fulfilling and dynamic and, and productive. This was an experience like that, but ramped up to the next level. And let me just start out with this image that you see here to, to my left, this, this image from this fantastic movie, The Abyss from 1989. Great movie, had this protagonist in it, Bud Brigman, who at one point in the movie has to drink this really awful fluoro hydrocarbon thing so he can better withstand the effects of high pressure. And then he jumps off this cliff you see there and eventually, after bouncing off some things, makes it makes his way to the abyss to the, and to the sea floor and announces touchdown and then the movie goes on. He gets rescued by aliens and uh, everything works out well. I think he inactivates a nuclear bomb, right? So it was a great movie, great, great movie. <laughs> and the guy who did all that technical filming in 1989 and who wrote that touchdown is the guy that I want to tell you about this evening, Jim Cameron, James Cameron well known both to the movie industry but to the ex exploration uh, folks, to the, the deep sea science industry. He's had 
more than 80 subdives in his lifetime. Incredible. Most of them with the mere submersibles um, associated with, with Russia, but, but many, many experiences going down in subs and, and exploring the, the deep sea. So I want to take you through an adventure that Jim catalyzed in secret more than five or six years ago, a program that brought together engineers from the United States and Australia to build a manned submersible that could go down to the deepest ocean trench, to the Challenger Deep. And, and it came to pass, the expedition started off of the coast of Papua New Guinea, the island of New Britain. A lot of engineering tests occurred there, and then it went on to the Mariana Trench to dives in the, in the Challenger Deep. So let me just take you through some of that. We, we started here in the New Britain Trench, and here's a blow up of that image, and you can see part of the, the trench here. You can also see in, in red and orange where there are volcanoes and where there have been earthquakes. This is a very seismically active area and uh, that's, that's uh, a focus in subduction zones, in convergent margins where you have a, an oceanic plate going underneath a, a continental plate creating a trench. So here's where we started off. Uh, we left from Australia to Port Moresby uh, in, in Papua New Guinea and then to the island of New Britain and the, and the, the city of Rabaul. And we did a number of tests there. After those were completed, the expedition went north here to the Mariana Trench, most of which is now a U.S. Marine National Monument, incidentally. And then from, from the Mariana Trench, we went south of Guam, first based in Guam, south of Guam, and to the southwest corner where the Challenger Deep is. And we did work in both the east part of the Challenger Deep, the west part, and in the, in the middle part as well. So three different locations within the deepest spot on Earth, about 11 kilometers below the, the, the sea surface. Okay, so here it is, this incredible green torpedo about 12 tons of, of, of fun, a very different kind of submersible, as you can see. It is configured typically in this vertical position. It had all sorts of novel features. Um, beneath all of this green paint was a lot of syntactic foam that had particularly useful buoyant properties at great depth. So a particular patented type of syntactic foam for buoyancy uh, developed through this, the, the development of this expedition. It had lots of lights. You can see on one boom arm here is a, is a light, a uh, panel of uh, LED lights here. Here you see them with, with the lights on. Lots of lights, lots of cameras. Um, on the manipulator arm, there was both a wide angle and a macro lens. On one of the booms here is a, is a set of, of lenses for 3D filming. There was a, an epic camera inside the, the sphere. That's the kind of camera that's used for IMAX filming. There was a film, there was a camera inside the sphere pointing at, at the pilot as, as well. So lots of filming capabilities. Um, what else can I tell you? The pilot's chamber, this, uh, this steel cylinder. In order to get a sub this small, everything had to be shrunk down, including, including that manned submersible. And it was so small and tight inside there that Jim had to uh, sit inside it with his legs crossed the whole time, eight, nine, ten hours in the sub with his legs crossed. He had all kinds of electronic equipment and life support equipment around him. The inside diameter was just 43 centimeters, so really small. But the idea was to come up with a sub that would be small enough and light enough at 12 tons that cranes could pick it up easily, cranes on standard offshore uh, supply vessels, and that it would be small enough that it could be put in, in a container and shipped around the world and be more portable. So they did all of these things. And this was the support vessel for the, the sub during both legs of the expedition, the Mermaid Sapphire, one of those offshore supply vessels. And here you see the crane that would lift up the sub and put it over on the, uh, on the port side there. Wonderful vessel held about 60 people. In conjunction with the submersible, there were these autonomous 
devices that we use, a couple of them, landers, that can drop down. They were equipped with lights and battery power and, uh, and cameras so they could do filming and they could take pictures. They also had, um, in, at least in this particular lander, an arm that could drop down and this fish trap and, and this water sampler could be deployed on, this, on the sea floor and with bait inside both of them they could attract various organisms that the sub could film and that the landers could collect and be brought back for, for study. And there's Jim Cameron on, on your left and Kevin Hardy on your right. Kevin Hardy is a senior, was a senior development engineer for many years here at Scripps and has been a good citizen of this institution, helped with our centennial celebrations. He is the person who, more than anybody else, uh, designed and developed and, and built the landers that were used during the, the expedition. Okay, so here's where the action started. This is Rabal, Papua New Guinea. Um, in the distance, you can see the volcano Tavurver, again, highlighting uh, this connection between uh, trenches, subduction zones, and volcanic activity. Um, in, the, in the harbor there, you can see the mermaid sapphire, so that gives you some sense of, of scale. I was on a boat other than the Mermaid Sapphire, and so my day would begin uh, uh, getting up early, getting on an inflatable with some colleagues. There were some writers from National Geographic and some photographers and people associated with the landers that were over on that ship. Uh, and we would, we would get an inflatable, would go over to the Mermaid Sapphire, so we had this wonderful morning commute and evening commute. The Solomon Sea in the evening, beautiful, absolutely stunning. Um, and so in the morning we'd get there, the film crew would be all set up, so uh, the biggest guys there, like, like this gentleman here, were members of the film crew because they had to carry these really heavy 3D cameras on their shoulders on a moving, rocking ship, sometimes on top of containers. Uh, really an impressive group. Here's John Bruno, an Academy Award film director who was there directing the, the filming uh, while we were out at sea, wonderful person. Um, and what would happen every morning is Jim would be there, he'd go through every sub-team of engineers and other professionals associated with the expedition, finding out how they were doing, how was the hydraulics, how, how, was, the, how was the battery performance, um, how was the acoustic communication, how were the landers coming along, and so on. And you really needed to be ready with an answer during those meetings, you know, you, not knowing was, wasn't acceptable. So. Uh, you had to have a plan. There were too many people depending on getting things together. Okay, so the most exciting sub dive was the very first one. The very first dive, it was only going down a kilometer, it wasn't setting any records. Nobody in the world, pretty much nobody in the world knew we were out there. And um, so it was just the, the, the band of, of folks involved with the expedition focused on the, uh, the, the, the issues at hand. And here's this beautiful sub as it's just going out into the water. I won't show you all the, the, the photos I have of deployment and recovery, but here is Jim after a very successful sub dive coming out of the submersible, looking good. There were some glitches with the sub um, during, during some of the dives. During the first dive, this dive here where you see Jim coming out looking really great, the temperature went up as high as 103 degrees inside. Um, and, and so that was a, that was a serious problem. Um, the temperature inside the sub, oftentimes it was about right at about um, Jim's midsection, but too cold up at his head, too cold at, at his feet. It was just something that, that he had to deal with. Um, during a, a, a subsequent dive, he heard a shot that sounded like a, a shotgun right behind his head. He was in the middle of filming this octopus at about four kilometers down and just kept, kept going and uh, asked the engineers afterwards to look into what had happened. Um, couldn't find any, anything wrong and just kept going. So there were some glitches, um, but, but overall the sub performed beautifully. So after this, this first dive, Jim goes right back to his editing room on the ship and some of us in a common view area can see on a monitor Jim editing film from that first sub dive. There was the sub, there was the lander, and there was a remote operated vehicle filming some of this. In fact, here's a, here's a picture. This is what was picked up by CNN 
of uh, the sub on that first dive coming up to the lander on the sea floor. So you get an image of them both together. Well, when both of when, when all of us involved with the expedition were seeing the split screen, seeing both of these instruments and how they were on the seafloor at, at, at some depth, it was just magical. It was like 2001, a space odyssey or some science fiction movie. It was just a beautiful view. So I think however people felt before that time, after seeing the, the imagery associated with this sub, everybody was, was just totally mesmerized and and captivated by the, the expedition and the challenges that, that Jim and company faced. Okay, a little bit about what was seen in the New Britain Trench, first by the sub and then by the landers. So here you see, looking out that porthole window with the epic camera taken away, you see the 3D camera looking back at the sub. You can see the jellyfish. This is actually the deepest manned submersible dive at the time. This is 8.2 kilometers in the, the New Britain Trench. So this is really, really deep. And this is also from that same dive, 8.2 kilometers. And, and remember, it's a 12-ton sub. Jim's coming up a, 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 along the face of the New Britain Trench. This hard substrate wall provides um, uh, location for these stock sea anemones. There's hundreds of them, hundreds of these sea anemones, and he's filming all of this. And with the macro lens, he's coming up really close, as, as you can see. Beautiful imagery, uh, really highlighted the capabilities of the camera systems that he had. Okay, and then the landers did filming as well. So here's the landers. This is shallow. You can see the cutthroat eels in the, in the foreground, the sub in the background. Um, this is just shallow, but it gives you an idea of how the, the landers could film the Deep Sea Challenge submersible. Um, and it's a little washed out because of the bright lights of the, of the submersible. But you can see that the landers were a pretty good tool for some of the filming as well. The landers also could collect organisms. This is an isopod. This was fairly shallow, um, but there was a guy on the expedition with a really nice macro lens, so back on the ship could get some really nice close-up images. So this is an isopod, but I think these are more impressive. So these are another kind of crustacean. These are amphipods. This is also 8.2 kilometers in the New Britain Trench, so really, really deep. Um, and these things are gigantic. So inside the fish trap, they're about 17 centimeters. And then outside, they got as big as about 30, 30 centimeters. And these are organisms that are usually the size of the last digit on, on your thumb. So they're usually um, really small. And these things were huge. You can get a little better idea of scale here. And you might wonder, what did we use to catch these giant creatures? This is, this is the deepest example of a phenomenon called gigantism yet reported, that way down at 8.2 kilometers, finding, finding these giant beasts. And um, the answer is chicken. Um, we put a whole chicken in the trap, and in a matter of hours, this is all that was left. And then you see a drumstick there? That was all that was. So these are incredible scavengers. In fact, these things would make a great science fiction movie if, if, if only they were a little larger, like, you know, like that. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't get that big. Uh, they were big, but they weren't that big. <laughs> so stay tuned. Uh, you know, I don't know what Jim has in store in the future. But, um, but I do want to emphasize that this business with collecting amphipods and characterizing them, Scripps has been doing this for a long time. People have been using landers, maybe not with the same kinds of uh, uh, bells and whistles, but landers that could go down deep and that had cameras and could do some filming. And um, this is an image from uh, a paper uh, first authored by Bob Hessler from the Marine Biology Research Division. Another author uh, is somebody who was a mentor to me, Art Yoyanos. And, and Bob Hessler was able to collect these amphipods. There's a close-up view. And uh, Art Yoyanos was able to characterize the microbes associated with them. And a lot of really novel science came out of that. Okay, so there was all this work in the, in the New Britain Trench and it was going very, very well. But there was also filming on land that occurred. And so just to give you a few glimpses of that, here's Jim here in a dugout canoe with a, with a little boy and he's just learning the, the ways of paddling a dugout canoe. And uh, also during that same trip, some kids were coming home from school and uh, 
you know, they, they looked pretty fierce with all these machetes and uh, lime on, the, on their cheeks and whatnot, but really good natured people. It was fun to be out in the countryside interacting with the people uh, on the island of New Britain, and we had a great time. One, one evening we went up late at night to watch a fire dance up in the, in the hills, and that was really great. So it wasn't all about work at sea, it was also filming on land as well. But all too soon, uh, the expedition this first leg of the expedition came to an end and it was time to head north to get on with the business of going to the Challenger Deep. And uh, as, as you know, the Challenger Deep is the deepest trench environment, the deepest part of the deepest trench environment on Earth. The Pacific Ocean has a lot of great trenches deeper than 10 kilometers. Here's the Challenger Deep though for scale. Um, the actual depth of the Challenger Deep is still being determined to this day. So there's still some issue about exactly how deep it is. But it's somewhere in this ballpark, 36,000 uh, feet uh, uh, and more. And, th and it, that's deeper than commercial airlines fly, than Mount Everest or any mountain is high. Um, certainly going to the, the Mariana Trench, the Challenger Deep, was deeper than any submersible has gone, uh, unless you consider the Bathyscaphe Gaff Trieste from 1960, um, which was a, a fairly simple device that went just straight down, stayed on the seafloor for 15, 20 minutes or so, and then, then came up. Uh, a great accomplishment, but uh, not a, de a device, not a, a manned submersible that had anything like the capabilities of, of Deep Sea Challenge. Okay, we had two ships going up to, when we were up in, uh, off the coast of Guam, working in the Mariana Trench. This is just showing you the fantail area of an Indonesian uh, oil supply vessel that some of us worked off of. It was a great platform for deploying landers. Here you see one being uh, taken out. Um, and for some of the science that we did as well, it was, it was very good. We had nice uh, facilities for doing some sample processing when we got samples from the landers as well. So. Uh, it was, it was uh, maybe not as good as uh, part of the Scripps fleet, but it was pretty good quarters, all things considered. Okay, so here we are finally, after replacing some of the crew and heading out from Guam, we're over the Challenger Deep. So this is a view from up top, looking from a distance. This is looking from that Indonesian vessel towards the Mermaid Sapphire, and you can make out the sub being deployed from the crane, being, being set in the water. There were two sub dives into the Challenger, Challenger Deep, one manned and one, and the first one unmanned. Um, and, and that unfortunately w was all. So he here is the view from the bottom. This is the deepest dive with Jim Cameron as pilots. And um, I'll, just, I'll just let this play. This is going to take a little bit, but I'll just let it play so you can hear some of the communication between the bridge and, and, and Jim Cameron. This is deep okay, sea I don't Challenger. know if you all heard that, but uh, some of you, I'm sure, heard Jim Depth talking about three, being there on the bottom. His first words were touchdown. So that was the second touchdown that I wanted you to, to hear. That wasn't quite so clear. But there he was, Everything Challenger Deep, the East Pond, as, as we call it, the East Pond of the Challenger Deep. Moments later, he was able to use the manipulator arm that you see there and push down and get a sediment sample. And that's great. You might also notice this manipulator arm. It's kind of difficult to see here, but there's a watch. It actually has a watch on its arm. And I want to highlight that that's a specially designed Rolex watch <laughs> made to, to withstand 16,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. So, so I don't know why you'd want one, 
But if you do, Rolex is your, your company. Rolex was a, a sponsor for the expedition. <laughs> so, so there you go. He's got some mud. So that's great. <laughs> I, I don't know if the watch worked afterwards. That's a good question. Yeah. This is the largest organism we saw on the seafloor in the Challenger Deep. Unfortunately, it's not alive. It's just the remains of some organism. We think it's a vertebrate several meters in, in length in the last stages of microbial decomposition. And so those, that, that, the dark that you see there is, is the result of sulfate reduction associated with microbial activity. So interesting to see. Sure wish we had been there several months before to see it when it was larger. And who knows what sort of community of invertebrates would have been associated with it and participating in its decomposition. But, um, but that was the, the largest organism we saw. OK, and then here's the very last lander drop. What you're seeing is the arm falling down, crashing onto the sea floor. It's going to kick up some sediment. There it goes. You see some beautiful rocks there. We're on a slope. It's kicking up some sediment. Uh, you see a little bit of matte material there being, being stirred up. Uh, a lot of that is being wafted into our water sampler. So our water sampler turned out to be a decent sediment sampler, at least surficial sediment sampler, which was fortuitous for, for us that, that that was the case. Uh, one of the people associated with the expedition is an astrobiologist, Kevin Hand. He's at the Jet Propulsion Labs. Very soon after the landers came up, he was looking at the, the images that were generated, and he noticed, noticed something really incredible. This, there were these mats on the sea floor right there. This, is, this isn't quite as deep as the Challenger Deep, but this is 10.7 kilometers down, and we've got rocks, and they're covered with all this greenish fuzz. Really amazing to, to, to see this. What, what in the world are these organisms? So Kevin and, and some others who know mineralogy realized in looking at the landscape here that a lot of the minerals that, that are there on the sea floor have been formed through the, re, the process of serpentinization. And the thing that you need to know about serpentinization is it's a mineralogical process that give, gives rise to hydrogen and methane good energy sources for, for some groups of microbes. We don't know what's going on at this juncture with what we're looking at here. But maybe we're looking at some organisms that are directly or, or maybe more likely indirectly living off of some of these energy sources. And so that's something that, that we're really interested in studying in more detail. OK, and that was the last lander drop. Boy, did we luck out to, to have a find like that at the very end. Afterwards, we soon went from this sort of operation where we were deploying these landers to this kind of an operation where we've got the landers back at Scripps and Sverdra Paul and we're taking things apart. I'm very happy to be able to report to you that we were able to get the samples from the expedition brought back to Scripps. Those that needed to be frozen were frozen. Those that needed to be preserved were preserved. Those that needed to be at low temperature and high pressure we're in pressure vessels in, in cold rooms. So everything made its way back. I was really concerned that we were going to get let off in some island in the west part of Micronesia, and we were going to have to try and somehow get things back in the appropriate state here at Scripps. And, and I'm happy to report that that didn't happen. OK, so everything ma made its way back here. And a, a number of Scripps scientists have had a chance to look over some of the information that's come out of this expedition. So for example, something that's really basic in oceanography, physical oceanographers look at CTD measurements. They look at measurements of conductivity, temperature, and depth. Those sorts of measurements at great depth are exceedingly rare. And that was part of what was possible with uh, the Deep Sea Challenge expedition. So the sub made those measurements when it went down and up. It had, had two drops. And there's a couple things that come out of that uh, sort of data. And this has been analyzed by Professor Lynn Talley, a physical oceanographer here at SIO. And one is in red, you see as the sub went down deep, and you look at the actual temperature, this is potential temperature in blue, actual temperature in red, the temperature actually goes up when you get really deep. And it goes up. 
um, when you go really deep because of the effect of pressure. High pressure is compressing that, that part of the water column, causing the heat to go up. And, and so the temperature actually w went up a degree and a half. So that's one thing to take note of. Also, uh, Lynn was looking at the salinity data. After about eight kilometers down, the salinity goes up a bit, just a hair, but enough to suggest that there's a new current flowing into the Challenger Deep or the Mariana Trench from about a depth of eight kilometers. No one's ever characterized such a current yet. So there's some potentially good data coming out of the physical oceanography. What about the biological? What, what, what did the, the sub see in terms of, of the, the, the biological uh, during the expedition? Well, there has been some analysis of that, the sorts of organisms that we're seeing, the amount of biomass, the amount of biodiversity um, in, in four different kinds of environments. So at one kilometer in the New Britain Trench, uh, there was a lot of runoff from the island. So there was actually um, coconut tree fronds and leaves on the sea floor. Uh, it was incredible. And there were a lot of um, sediment mounds that attracted things like crinoids and soft corals and anemones and, and fish and crustaceans as well. And then at 3.8 kilometers, it was really interesting. The seafloor all looked like this. And you know, I wasn't that excited about worms before going out on this expedition. <laughs> But all of those marks are caused by spoonworms, uh, a, a certain kind of echiurin worm, spoonworms. Um, they were everywhere. You couldn't avoid seeing the signs of the trails of spoonworms. So that was really impressive. And then I already showed you the video of the stalk sea anemones down at 8.2 kilometers. And then the Challenger Deep, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Much less biomass and biodiversity than these other places, though. So biodiversity um, was highest. This is a plot of sample size, so looking at organisms on the seafloor from video, and then the expected numbers of species based on what you see in some of these, uh, these earlier uh, samples here. And this is work by a, a PhD student at Scripps, Natasha Gallo, with Lisa Levin, a noted biological oceanographer. Here. And so biodiversity was very high at one kilometer, and then it went down after that. And the, the, the least biodiversity was present in the Challenger Deep. But in the Challenger Deep, there were three major kinds of organisms. There were these things here. I didn't think these things looked like much. Um, but a little better view, a close up of what they probably look like is in, in detail is this. These are among the largest single-celled organisms on the planet. They're a kind of foraminifera called a xenophyophore. They live off of particles descending from above. And you can see it when you quantify these xenophyophores, they go up really high in the Challenger Deep. So the Challenger Deep was full of these things. Also, the Challenger Deep was full of these little things here. So here you can see a view out the, 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 the port window on the sub. Here's the manipulator arm. That little thing there blown up. It doesn't look like much, but that is a kind of sea cucumber. We don't exactly know what species. There hasn't been much work in the Challenger Deep. Um, looking at these sorts of, of creatures probably is a new species. Uh, we, we just don't know yet. Um, but there were lots of sea cucumbers as well. Sea cucumber abundance goes up with depth, and that is even true in the Challenger Deep. Um, and then. Uh, the amphipods. Now, this is from <clears throat> this is from uh, the New Britain Trench, um, and in the Challenger Deep, the amphipods were normal size; they weren't the huge guys. But we did recover lots of them. So we got the amphipods from the New Britain Trench, the amphipods from the Challenger Deep, and looked at those in some more detail. And I just wanted to mention some work from Greg Rouse and uh, and Carvajal looking at the phylogenetics of the amphipods we recovered. And the bottom line is Greg Rouse has found multiple species of amphipods. So we have lots of new crustaceans that were discovered as a result of this expedition. And another scientist, Paul Yancey, a former PhD student at Scripps, who's now at Whitman College in Washington, looked at the organic osmolites in these amphipods. And Paul found out something incredible. So you see here the distribution of small organic compounds present in, on the left, shallow water crustaceans, and on the right, 
an, uh, an amphipod from the Challenger Deep. And there's two things I want to tell you about here. One is the amphipods in the Challenger Deep have lots of TMAO. That's trimethylamine anoxide. It's a compound that seems to help protect proteins and lipids, tissues from the effect of high pressure. So having an increased amount of TMAO is, is important and consistent with, with prior research from Paul's group. But what Paul had never seen before was what you see in red, skylo inositol. So why should you care about this small little organic molecule, skylo inositol? It's currently fast-tracked by the FDA for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. It's a discovery that was made at the University of Toronto. They were looking at the formation of the amyloid plaques associated with Alzheimer's. They found that lipids um, containing inositol can enhance the formation of those plaques. So they looked for compounds related to these lipids that would inhibit the process. And they came upon skylo inositol. And here it is in an amphipod from 11 kilometers down. Just an incredible discovery. I don't know why they have it, um, but it's really interesting. So stay tuned. Also from these amphipods, we were able to isolate, as Art Yanos had, had done years previously, uh, we were able to isolate deep sea microbes. And also from the mud that Jim collected and from, from the water. So we, we got that material into pressure vessels and into various kinds of media. And this is a plot that shows lots of different species of microbes, either from um, cold deep ocean trenches or from hydrothermal vents. And the names don't matter, but you can see some of them grow really, really pretty high in terms of pressure, up to 100 megapascal. From, from this expedition, we have organisms that are growing that high or higher, and also at some pretty warm temperatures, which is useful for some, some analyses that get performed. And part of the secret was we gave them TMAO to breathe, that osmolite that the amphipods have, deep ocean microbes breathe. And we gave them lots of different substrates. We found microbes that will decom decompose um, uh, chitin and cellulose and detergents and methanol and all sorts of things. So we have lots of microbes in culture. And we've also partnered with friends at the J. Craig Venter Research Institute to look at the cells using culture independent means. And I won't go through all the technology there, but the upshot of that is we can look for the identification of new microbial species by sorting individual bacterial cells, amplifying their DNA, and then using molecular sequence information to identify them. And when we do that, we find that from the amphipod seawater, we have almost a pure culture of something that's a Saccharomonas that makes omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids and it belongs to the same genus uh, as the first microbe ever discovered by Art Yoyanos that grew preferentially at high pressure. So that was interesting. And then from the sediment that Jim collected, we found, perhaps a surprise to many of you, that the most abundant microorganism is cyanobacteria. These are photosynthetic organisms that live off of sunlight. And what happens is they grow in great abundance in surface waters, aggregate, and then sink to the sea floor. And so that's what we're seeing. The result of, of phytoplankton that have gone down 11 kilometers to settle on the sea floor and, and die. Okay, well that's, that's all I have to tell you this evening. Let me just cap, cap it off here. So in terms of some of the discoveries, it's been possible to make deep CTD measurements to tell us something about heating and mixing in deep ocean environments. We've discovered holothurians in the Challenger Deep, the deepest example of gigantism in amphipods. Uh, we've discovered multiple species of amphipods. We've discovered that skyloinositol can actually be an, an organic osmolite in deep sea amphipods. And we have many extremophilic microbes in culture or whose, whose genomic DNA has been amplified. So I'll end it there. I want to thank, of course, uh, James Cameron, his amazing team of engineers, friends elsewhere that were directly involved in work in my lab and, and the various funding sources in, involved with the expedition and some of the work here at Scripps. And I'd be pleased to, to address any questions. Thank you.
Yes, please. What was the temperature at the bottom of the trench? The temperature at the bottom of the Challenger Deep was something like two and a half degrees. So it was a little bit warmer um, than one might expect, and that's because of the adiabatic compression. Mm -hmm. Still pretty cold. I mean, it's not like it's that warm because of pressure, but it is, it is different than other deep ocean environments. Yeah. Uh -huh. y yes? Deep water circulation as that tries to rise and other water flows in. Yeah, so the question is regarding deep water circulation. Some of that may rise and other water may flow into the trench. Well, there, you know, it's interesting. When we looked at the initial videotape of the Challenger deep dive, Jim went down in a part of the trench where the Keiko remote operated vehicle has, has been in the past, but several years in the past. And Jim was able to see and film the tracks that remained on the seafloor from that remote operated vehicle. So the current flow can't be that great. But, but, there are, but there are these deep ocean currents and they should be characterized in more detail. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Was the drive tr train independent? Yeah, th so the sub could be operated in either an autonomous uh, underwater vehicle mode or under piloted mode. And so uh, it was in this AUV, this autonomous underwater mode, for the, the first unmanned dive into the Challenger Deep over in, into the West Pond. And then for the manned dive with Jim as pilot in the East Pond, um, Jim was always at the controls. He was controlling everything. He was always busy controlling the filming and, and following all the monitors. The sub was equipped with something kind of like an autopilot mode so he could stay a certain distance right off the sea floor as he, as he was moving along. He could easily see in a glance uh, his altitude and his speed and, and some other, uh, other uh, aspects of, of the outside and inside sub environment. But it was always him doing the flying. Yeah. Um, yes, back there and then over, over here. So the question is, what is the distance between the New Britain Trench and the, and the, the Mariana Trench and the Challenger Deep? I don't know exactly. The New Britain Trench is in the southern hemisphere and the, the Mariana Trench is in the northern hemisphere. Um, well over a thousand miles had, had to be traversed to get from one to the others. There also had to be a, a voyage across the equator. You know, we had this really interesting international crew, but a lot of the engineers were from Australia as well as the United States. So, and so there's always a ritual when you cross the equator. And, and so because we had all these Australians, the ritual involved Vegemite um, for this, <laughs> this trip across the equator. Um, and I, I actually, I wasn't there. I, I flew to, to Guam, so I don't know all the details, but I know that was part of it. So it was long enough that there had to be some special Vegemite ceremony associated <laughs> with the crossing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so over here. What's the duration of the manned voyage descent time on the bottom? The total length of time, I think, was something like eight hours with maybe five hours or so of, of bottom time. Let's see if that adds up. The sub could go down at a speed of about 1.5 meters per second and it came up about twice as fast, so about three meters per second. So it was really fast going down. At full speed, I think it could uh, get down in something like an hour. It was, or maybe, I'm sorry, maybe go down in two hours and up in, in one hour. It was you know, remarkable. Yeah, something like that. Yes, and there was another question back there. Yes, the rocks. What kinds of rocks were they? Were they, were they carbonates? And um, the geologists who have looked at those images, and all we have is images. We didn't collect any, any rocks. Um, the rocks seem to be, as I mentioned, the product of serpentinization. So minerals like olivine were, were present. Um, but no carbonates. That's a really good question about the carbonates because you might imagine for certain microbial processes on the seafloor, like the oxidation of methane under anaerobic conditions in the sediment, you can make giant blocks of, of carbonate. We didn't see those kinds of concretions on the, on the seafloor. So we didn't see any signs of carbonate. But you know, if you go away from the, the, the Challenger Deep towards the overriding plate, there are a number of seeps and mud volcanoes, and in those environments, 
you will certainly see carbonates. And there's some very impressive chimney structures uh, as well that, that one can come across. Uh, but no, in the Challenger Deep, we, we, we didn't um, see any signs of carbonates. So what's been done is Kevin Hand, this astrobiologist at the JPL, collected sediment, sieved sediment, sediment, has done a variety of spectroscopic analyses. They're all consistent with minerals being produced via serpentinization. He's done some nice SEM analyses um, as well. And I didn't mention it. We've done um, with friends at the J. Craig Venter Research Institute some cell sorting on those samples. We have a tremendous concentration, perhaps representing the microbial mat, of an organism called Paracoccus, which is known to oxidize hydrogen and reduce sulfur compounds. We don't know for a fact that that's what's happening, but it all seems to tie together into a tidy story. Yeah. Yes? Um, at these depths, I'm surprised to hear that you found some of the largest single-celled organisms. Do you have any hypotheses about why that might be possible at depths? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. So why do we see such large organisms? Uh, you could ask the same question for the amphipods that we saw in the New Britain Trench and these xenophyophores in the Challenger Deep. I think in these deep trench environments that it's a feast or famine existence. And there's some benefit to being larger so that when the food comes, when there is a rain of detrital material from phytoplankton or when a large organism uh, falls to the sea floor, uh, that, that an organism that can get the most nutrition from that nutrient source, that those sporadic nutrient sources, has an advantage. That's the argument that I've heard. But you also find very small organisms in some deep ocean trenches. So it's not a universal property. But in general, what I've heard from other biologists is that gigantism can be an advantage for, peop for, for organisms that have a feast and famine existence. And so when the, when the feast comes, you want to be large enough to be able to benefit as much as possible from that. Yeah. Yes. Is the submarine on display? No, unfortunately, the, the submarine is not on display. This is a, it's a really important question. We, all of us want to know, when is that sub going to go back in the water? Um, Personally, I don't want to see it on display. I want to see it on a, on a ship and, and going out to sea. Um, and we don't know the answer to that. Right now, uh, Jim is very involved with the production of Avatars 2 and 3. So stay tuned for, for that. But you know, he gets involved with these, these great film uh, ventures in part at least, because that helps to fund the other part of his passion, which is deep sea exploration. So we have to wonder after Avatars 2 and 3, what's next in terms of deep sea exploration? Where will he go? Will the sub get back in the water? Those are all really important things to know. We don't have an answer yet. Yeah. Yes, so the question is, what was the pressure uh, in the environment at the Challenger Deep, and what are the the, the factors, what are the complications in, in, associated, with bring, yeah, associated with bringing organisms up? Um, the pressure outside was about 1,000 atmospheres, so 1,000 times our pressure right here. Um, and we did not uh, use pressure retaining samplers to bring the organisms up. They came up thermally insulated, so they, they stayed cold, they stayed dark, um, but they decompressed. And um, we don't know what we lost by allowing things to come up with decompression. We don't know what microbes we lost. And, and with the larger organisms, um, certainly like with the amphipods that were collected, those weren't going to remain alive, at least for very long, following that, that long transit to the surface. If we had been able to keep the organisms under pressure, they definitely would have survived longer, especially if we could have kept oxygenated seawater flowing past them in a high pressure, low temperature, dark environment. This kind of thing has been done. Art Yayanos succeeded in doing this once upon a time and was able to keep some deep ocean amphipods alive for, I think it was at least a month. So uh, if you can collect without decompression, it's a tremendous advantage. Um, but you can certainly isolate lots of microbes that will grow up at high pressure even after decompression. So the microbes 
we, we have no data that indicates that we're losing any of them, although we well could be. Um, but we do know with the larger multicellular organisms, decompression is a big problem. Uh, yeah, really good point. How was the sub powered? It was all electric. It had um, uh, batteries that were placed into these bread box like structures that were enclosed with a, a, a bladder so that under high pressure, the bladder would allow seawater to flow in into it and, and take up the, the pressure. Um, but yeah, it was all, it was all battery powered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I want to thank you so much for a great talk. <laughs>